Well, it's Tuesday here on Trek Zone, which means it is talk and science time. Dr. Brad Tucker is standing by at Melbourne Airport. He's on his way to Perth. Brad, thanks for your time. No worries. Science is everywhere. <laughs> Last week, science never sleeps. Now it's everywhere. See, it's 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 every it's like Visa everywhere you want to be. <laughs> and something about Mastercard as well. That's How, right. Uh, exactly. Science is priceless. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Hey, now, um, you sent me a link this morning. I was a little bit concerned by this, and then I actually read the headline. Turns out there isn't an asteroid on the way to destroy all life on Earth in 2027. What is the European Space Agency doing? Well, look, that's right. It's not happening, but the question is, what if it was going to happen? Uh, you know, it's it's one of those things where, yeah, we're not really worried about an asteroid, you know, wiping us out a la dinosaurs, um, because... We, you know, we know most of those, but what we do worry about are a the city-sized meteors that could potentially wipe out a city, or on that rare occasion, what happens if it's a really big one? And now, you know, this is all fine and good, but what do you actually practically do? Like, I mean, I think it's actually a fair question. You know, we we've seen Armageddon and Deep Impact, where the world goes into chaos, but Bruce Willis isn't around forever, right? So we need a Plan B. <laughs> and uh, so the question was that NASA and Ethan, another one asked, is let's say we had a large asteroid that was going to hit the Earth, what would we be? You know, how would science react? How would we tell people? What plans would be in place? Because you don't want just pandemonium and chaos. And so they said, hey, let's do a disaster drill to see what would happen if something were about to smash into the Earth. How accurate can we get uh, eight years out from potential impact? Uh, how accurate could we be as to where that's going to strike the Earth? Well, it depends on the size and the orbit. Surprisingly pretty good. Um, once we know the orbit pretty well down, we will know then essentially when it's going to hit the Earth, at least the Earth's atmosphere. Like, And that's, that's the beginning of, of the critical component is we'll start to know at least when the Earth's atmosphere is about to be hit. Uh, and then at that point, once we know that's going to happen, we can know the relative area. Um, you know, we're pretty good at finding and plotting the orbits of these things once we have enough observations and data and that sort of stuff. Um, but there's no reason to think that, you know, we couldn't do this for a big one. We could do this for really small ones. You know, we know to a really precise point, you know, when an eight meter asteroid is going to fly in between the Earth and the moon, for instance, and at exactly what time it's closest. And so therefore, we know pretty well, at least where it's going to hit on the Earth. I would say like, you know, we can get it down to the hundreds of square kilometers, which is, you know, for something like this is probably what you would need. That's pretty impressive. And the fact too, that um with this simulation, there was only a 1% chance of this asteroid slamming into Earth, but that's enough to cause some great alarm, isn't it? That's right. That's right. I mean, a 1% chance, that means, you know, yeah, 99 times out of 100 it won't happen but that one time. <laughs> Good it's, night. You know, it's, it's um, all that matters, really, isn't it? Yeah, you know, it, it's it's you know, it's the classic insurance case, right? You know, the probability might be low, but if the impact or the effects are really high, that's what you worry about. Or you could have something that just has low impact but high probability of happening. So it's a case of it's if it's low, but you know, it's low enough that you actually warrant the threshold that all right, we should start to have a think about it, you know. And again, it's it's starting to have that conversation, what is the response if it's a, a one percent chance or a ten percent chance or a fifty percent chance, right? You know, if you have a one out of two chance, you can imagine that some of your reactions will be different than say a one percent chance. And so they, you know, I think they played it well. Let's just say a, a real but small possibility, but something that we should plan for. How would, you know, federal emergencies do? How would, you know, um, economies, how would all those things make plans? Because we need to know. And so I thought it was a really cool exercise in the sense that, hey, here's something that we should really think about and try and do properly because we just can't wing it. Because statistically, there is going to be a 10 meter size asteroid that hits over a large city and causes a amount of damage uh, at some point. Those happen once every two decades. We saw it over Russia, you know, in 2013. You know, something like that, if it were to explode over, say, Sydney or L.A., that would cause a huge amount of damage uh, and impact. And something like that would still need to be prepared for. But we don't have any plans. Well, it turns out people don't know what to do and, and everyone <laughs> failed. So. It, it was a miserable <laughs> fail. That's right. That's exactly what you want to hear. Um, <laughs> but I, I think it's a good reason it failed because it showed that, all right, this is actually really hard. And yes, it's not a real thing yet. 
but it might be. Uh, and we, you know, just as the same reason we do fire drills or, you know, in California, I grew up doing earthquake drills. You do it for that chance that it is going to happen at some point. And we do know a rock will slam into the earth at some point. We don't know which one or when, but at some point it will. We need a plan for it. Um, so we don't have pandemonium and chaos. Well, having said that there aren't any rocks falling from the sky just yet, there kind of are. <laughs> uh, there's a meteor shower this week. That's right. A slightly different version. These are rocks you don't have to be worried about. Uh, so, yeah, so this is the, the Eta Aquarian meteor shower, which is now just at its peak. Um, and so this is uh, bits of rock and ice that have actually come off uh, Halley's Comet. So, you know, Halley's Comet does a loop around the sun every 75-ish years. And, and kind of like when a boat goes through the water, it leaves like a wake of debris. And so as the Earth passes through that debris trail, those little bits of rock and ice burn up into our skies and produce a, a brilliant meteor shower. Now, uh, Australia's in a prime uh, location for this one this year, aren't we? That's right. So, you know, some meteor showers favor the northern and the southern hemisphere better. This is a really good one for the southern hemisphere, so it's not great for those in the northern hemisphere. Um, and the conditions are pretty good. So um, there's a, it was a new moon on Sunday, which means the moon is dark, so it's not really bright and washing out the faint ones. Also... You know, the, the parts of the debris trail are, are a bit thicker and denser in other patches. So it depends where you pass through about how many meteors. So we're going through a good patch of sky. Uh, and ultimately, you know, uh, as I say, meteor showers are a bit like cats. You don't really know what they're going to do, but they will do something. You just don't know when. Um, and people have found that, hey, this one appears to be going to be a good one. And so the conditions are right. So in the southern hemisphere, it's been actually quite good. Um, you know, on, on Sunday night, mon so it's Monday morning, people, I know some people saw like 100 over three hours. Um, a lot of a lot of them last night well. So it really is producing, you know, 15 to 25 meteors or shooting stars per hour in a city, right, even in a, in a bright, relatively bright area. That's incredible. But, of course, the best time to see this is between uh, 3 a.m. And, and dawn So and in a, in a nice dark location. So is there going to be an exodus out to uh, out to the country? <laughs> well, I think some people have been trying to find it, you know. So, so it isn't over. So you do have tomorrow morning and Thursday morning to catch it, and the peaks are still pretty good. Um, and, as, and as you said, like, you got a couple hours to see this good rate, um, but you – the, the fainter or the darker it is for you, the fainter the meteors you'll be able to see. So, you know, even if you go to a nearby oval, it maximizes your chance. But yeah, the further you go, the more and more you'll see and, and the, the fainter ones, and that will really produce that, that brilliant shower effect almost. Fantastic, Brad. Well, we better let you go and catch that plane to Perth, but you are, of course, heading over to Perth for your uh, space and uh, or universe in the future of space uh, program. Are there tickets still available for people to attend your public show? There, there, there are. So there's. So it's all free. So we, we're in uh, Warwick, so North Perth uh, tonight, and then I'm going down to Bunbury uh, Wednesday night and back to Perth uh, in the in the city centre on Thursday. So there's still tickets available. Um, the skies are looking pretty good, uh, and I have a bunch of telescopes ready to do some good stargazing. Fantastic. And then you get to wake up early for a meteor shower, so what's not to like? Well, I was just going to say, are you going to stick it out and, and just wait until 3 in the morning when the, when the optimum uh, viewing angle comes around? Well, I do have to leave early to drive, so, you know, we'll get up a bit early. That's what I did this morning, you know, before I caught my flight. I was like, hey, there's some meteors burning up. <laughs> so, you know, that's always nice. Fantastic, Brad. We'll enjoy my old stomping grounds uh, of Perth, and uh, we'll chat to you again next week on Talking Science. Thanks, Matt.